Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. All India Radio is happy to present the annual Sardar Patel Memorial Lectures. We have here with us Dr. Karan Singh speaking on integral education. I invite Sri Amrit Rao Shinde, Director General, All India Radio, to introduce the speaker. Ladies and gentlemen, I have great pleasure in extending to all of you a hearty welcome. This series of Sardar Patel Memorial Lectures were instituted by All India Radio in the memory of our illustrious leader and architect of India's political consolidation, Sardar Vallabhai Patel. Sardar Vallabhai Patel was also the first Minister for Information and Broadcasting, in addition to Home and States Minister and Deputy Prime Minister of Independent India. This series of lectures are aimed at adding to the body of knowledge on the subjects of public importance and promoting awareness and generating discussion on contemporary subjects. The first lecture in this series was delivered by the late Sri Chakravarti Raj Gopalachari in 1955. We have had in the last two decades in this series a galaxy of eminent scholars and thinkers. It is our privilege in having Dr. Karan Singh to address us today in this series of lectures. Dr. Karan Singh needs no introduction. He is a well-known poet, writer, and a scholar, and his lifelong devotion has been to the field of art, culture, and Indology. He was Minister for Tourism and Civil Aviation, Health and Family Planning, Education and Culture in the Union Cabinet. Dr. Karan Singh had personal contacts with Sardar Patel in the early years of his life. Recently, he founded the International Center for Science, Culture, and Consciousness, which is emerging as an important center of creative thought. Dr. Karan Singh was for many years Chancellor of Jammu and Kashmir University, as well as Banaras Hindu University, besides being associated with many other cultural and academic institutions. He has been awarded several honorary degrees, including doctorate from Banaras Hindu University, Aligarh Muslim University, and Soka University, Tokyo. Dr. Karan Singh will in his lecture today and tomorrow talk to us about integral education. Now I request Dr. Karan Singh to deliver the first part of Sardar Patel Memorial Lecture. Dr. Karan Singh. Shri Amrit Rao Shinde, Director General of All India Radio, distinguished members of the audience, and my invisible, though very tangible listeners. Three men dominated the last phase of our freedom movement. Mahatma Gandhi, Jawaharlal Nehru, and Sardar Vallabhai Patel. Their roles were, in a very extraordinary way, complementary. Mahatma Gandhi providing the moral and spiritual impetus and the overall guidance. This Jawaharlal Nehru, radio the visionary, the revolutionary mass leader. And Sardar Vallabhai Patel, the statesman, administrator, consolidator. It is this trinity of leadership, I think, that was predominant in those critical years when, after centuries, British colonialism disappeared and India emerged as a free, sovereign country. Of course, there were other leaders also of great stature and talent. There was Maulana Azad, who was for so many years President of the Indian National Congress and our first education minister. There was Dr. Rajinder Prashad, our first president. There was Dr. 
see Rajagopalachari, Rajaji, the first governor general, Dr. Ambedkar, the father of the constitution, and so on. But the way in which the movement finally came to its culmination found these three people playing the critical role. The Sardar's role in our modern history was of crucial importance. During the freedom movement, he was a pillar of strength to Gandhiji. In fact, from the Bardoli Satyagraha, where he first gained the title of Sardar or leader, right up to the time of freedom, Sardar Patel was Gandhiji's right-hand man as far as organizational matters was concerned. His unwavering fortitude, his tremendous courage, perseverance and organizational skills made him absolutely indispensable in the many ups and downs of our freedom this movement. All India Radio After freedom, Sardar Patel lived for only three years. He was Deputy Prime Minister and Home Minister and Minister of Information and Broadcasting, and he tackled the immense tasks of building a shattered nation. Let us not forget the situation that actually existed in 1947. With the partition of the subcontinent, millions of people had been uprooted. One of the largest mass migrations in human history was taking place. Hundreds of thousands of people on both sides of the border were being killed. And in that tremendously volatile situation, Sadar Patel and Jawaharlal Nehru strove tirelessly to put the newborn nation on its feet. Despite their temperamental differences, they had the highest regard and respect for each other and uh, made a team which was unique at that particular juncture. The main achievement after independence, for which Sardar Patel will be remembered, of course, was the integration of the Indian states. A saga by itself into which I cannot possibly go because I am simply paying my tribute to the man in whose memory these lectures have been instituted. It has been extensively uh, documented. Uh, I saw, I was looking through some books and I saw a parallel drawn between Bismarck's unification of Germany in the 19th century and Sardar Patel's unification of India. But Sardar's task was far more difficult and far more complex because both in size and diversity and complexity, India the Indian Radio situation was much more difficult than the German situation a century earlier. And it meant uh, having a leader who would combine firmness, tact, a deep knowledge of human psychology, and administrative and legal acumen and capacity. And as Gandhiji wrote uh, to somebody during that period, there was not another man in India at that time who could have achieved what Sardar Patel achieved. Uh, the integration of India must rank as one of the great achievements in world history. And as I see it, free India itself is a permanent memorial to Sardar Patel. I must also add, although it may not be fashionable to do so, that the integration of the states, the peaceful integration of the states, was a tribute to the good sense and patriotism of the princes themselves. They did not have very much of an alternative, but nonetheless, they were also Indians and they were also patriotic and they uh, coordinated and cooperated with the Sardar in this important task. Uh, coming as I do from, um, from what was at one time the largest uh, princely state in India and certainly the most complex and the most difficult, uh, and the most complicated, I had the privilege of coming into touch with Sadar Patel at a very early age. I have written it up in my autobiography, so I will not go into details, except to say that while it was Pandit Jawaharlal Nehru who was dealing directly with Jammu and Kashmir, it was Sardar Patel 
who carried on the correspondence with my father, which ultimately uh, led to a smooth recorded. transition in Jammu and Kashmir. In fact, uh, the first volume of the collected correspondence of Sadar Patel edited by the late Lala Durga Das is entirely about Kashmir and contains many letters written to my father, my mother and to me. I was in fact quite uh, astonished uh, to read that correspondence, to reread that correspondence. Uh, if I may strike a personal note, I owe him a deep debt of gratitude for, for three particular matters. Firstly, for insisting that I be sent abo abroad for treatment. I was ill at the time, I was confined to bed, and uh, I don't think my parents would have sent me abroad. I probably would have remained a cripple for the rest of my life. Had Sadar Patel not, on one of his visits, to our house in Jammu, very uh, clearly told my father and my mother particularly, I was the only child, she was very attached to me, that if you do not send this young man abroad for treatment, he's going to remain in bed for the rest of his life. I was confined to a wheelchair at the time, and so it was Sardar Patel who insisted that I go abroad, and who, as the correspondence shows, was good enough to organize the plane and other arrangements in New York for my treatment. So the fact that I am, uh, what, 40 years later, by God's grace, fit and standing here and talking with you, in a way, is, uh, is as a result of the Sardar's direct intervention. <laughs> the second point for which I will remain grateful to him is um, the fact that it was he who suggested a matrimonial alliance with Nepal. I will not go into detail except to say that um, uh, at that time um, my wife was a, was a granddaughter of the last Rana Prime Minister and Sadar Patel indirectly I think thought that a matrimonial alliance with Nepal might be a good idea and uh, that matrimonial alliance also took place and by God's grace is going strong till today. <laughs> and uh, finally also he was responsible for smoothening uh, my appointment as regent of the state. Uh, it's a complex issue, but uh, there, was, there were problems with my father. But Sadar Patel was the one who tackled them with great finesse and with great dignity. And as a result of that, at the age of 18, I was appointed regent and then went on to become Sadri Riyasat and so on. I had the privilege of being his guest for three weeks in Dehradun in April of 1949. Uh, Moneyman was there at the time and she looked after me with, uh, with great uh, affection. And I remember that uh, although he was very ill at the time, in fact he had gone to Dehradun to convalesce uh, as a result of uh, the doctor's uh, orders, but uh, he was always uh, very um, courteous and very alert and I remember having long talks with him about the situation in Kashmir and the various personalities emerged uh, concerned with the uh, Kashmir problem. So um, I'm sorry I've taken a few minutes to pay my, my tribute to him, but I thought that as this was an occasion uh, to, uh, to do so, I should say a few words uh, reflecting not only our general um, gratitude to the Sardar, for what he did for this country, but my personal sense of gratitude. And today, it happens to be the this 15th of India December. Radio, this was the day, the exact day that he passed away in 1950. And so I think it is but appropriate that uh, uh, I pay my homage to this great leader today through the medium of All India Radio, which uh, has always been such a powerful and important uh, mode of communication in this country. Having done this, I will now move on to the topic of my lectures. I have chosen, as you may have seen, the title Integral Education. I think it's important to define the term integral. The dictionary definition is necessary to the completeness of whole,
complete. Uh, education, of course, is probably the most important activity that any civilization can embark upon. Because education is the medium through which a civilization renews itself and passes down to generations yet unborn the quintessence of the wisdom, the knowledge, the experience, the technology that it has received. Now, we in India are heirs to one of the most powerful intellectual and educational traditions in human history. And I refer, of course, to the first documented educational system in India, the Vedic Upanishadic system. Although it may have been confined to a small section of the population, nonetheless, it was an extremely powerful and luminous system. The method of passing on the wisdom from the rishi this to the shishya, from the guru to the shishya. The way in which our students used to cluster around the guru and learn from him. The dialogue, the method of dialogue, not unlike the Socratic dialogues of Greece, where uh, the uh, students used to listen, not only listen, where the students used to ask questions. If you read the Upanishads, you will find a questioning mind. It was by no means a monologue on the part of the teacher. They were questioned by the um, disciples, and it was in response to those questions that a lot of the teaching was uh, given. And so we have this very powerful tradition going back many thousands of years, representing one of the high watermarks of uh, human intellectual endeavor. And then, of course, many streams joined into this uh, great tradition. The Buddhist stream, for example, the whole Buddhist system of education. Nalanda was one of the greatest universities that the world has ever known. And they had their own system of teaching through the Sangha and through the lay disciples. And then later on, the Islamic uh, influx, then the Christian missionaries and their educational system, and then uh, with the British system of so-called modern education of Lord Macaulay. So, Today, our educational system really is the result of a long process of many thousands of years in which there are elements even today visible of all the various streams that came into our educational system. Now, I do not intend uh, to undertake a detailed uh, statistical study of our educational system because that has been done by other people and this is not really an appropriate forum to do that. What I will try and do this is all today India and Radio tomorrow archives is to share with you some observations into the whole system and maybe some insights, if you like, uh, with emphasis on the integral aspects of education. And as I said, the whole meaning of integral education is that it must be able to cover the entire human condition and the totality of the human personality. It is not enough to look upon education simply as an academic endeavor which enables young people to pass examinations and then to get gainful employment or to remain unemployed as the case may be. It is really a much deeper, a much fuller undertaking. And now that we are living in a period when there is a paradigm shift to a new holism, uh, it is all the more important that uh, this education should become integral. And perhaps before I go on to the various dimensions of the educational system, I might dwell for a moment on this, this paradigm shift. As you are aware, for the last three or four centuries, human thought was dominated by a dichotomous materialistic philosophy, what I call the Cartesian, Newtonian, Marxist view. And that view was based upon an essential dichotomy between matter and spirit, between science and spirituality, between body and mind. It was a dichotomous uh, system of looking at the world. And it involved, by its very nature, it involved conflict, competition, 
and a great deal of, uh, of hostile interaction. Now, this, is this uh, radio way of looking at the world certainly brought great achievements. There is no doubt the achievements of modern science, the tremendous growth of science and technology, the great gifts of economic progress, medicine, communications, a uh, hundred other aspects of life. But at the same time, this paradigm, this way of looking at reality, brought about the most awesome destructive power that the human race has ever known. The nuclear age in which we now live came into being on the 6th of August 1945, which was the day the atomic bomb was thrown on Hiroshima. And that atomic bomb, as you know, obliterated half a million people. I happened to be in Hiroshima last year, on the 6th of August, because every year they gather in the Hiroshima Peace Park directly at the spot where the uh, bombs fell, where the bomb fell. And I had some idea of the sort of destruction that took place. Now today, a single nuclear warhead is equal to 1,000 of the bombs that obliterated Hiroshima. Please mark my words, 1,000 times more powerful than the Hiroshima bomb are one of our nuclear warheads today. And there are 50,000, at least 50,000 such nuclear warheads on planet Earth. And therefore you can see that although science and technology have given us tremendous power, that power can be used both for good and for evil. One trillion US dollars, the equivalent of one trillion US dollars every year in all world currencies is spent on weapons of mass destruction. There is enough fissionable material today to destroy this the earth and all, all its inhabitants and all form of life on earth. Therefore, the old pattern of thinking now is no longer adequate and what we have to do we have to move into a new holistic paradigm, a paradigm that stresses convergence rather than conflict, that stresses cooperation rather than uh, uh, competition. And that is why any educational policy today and any approach to education must also be holistic. You can no longer divide education into different levels or divide the human personality into different parts it has to be it has to be a holistic approach on the other hand along with the holism there has to be growth not stagnation because uh, in india as you know we had the constitutional directive to universalize elementary education by 1960 we are now in 1988 going on to 89 and we are still nowhere near achieving even that basic target that was put forward as a constitutional necessity by our founding fathers. There are still vast disparities, submerged areas and communities. And although a great deal of growth has taken place, it is lopsided growth. It is not yet an integral growth uh, which would cover all areas and all regions and all classes. It tends to be lopsided. Therefore, what we need is an integral approach to education. And I will deal with this integral approach in four different categories. I will deal with the importance of physical growth, the importance of intellectual growth, the importance of social growth, and the importance this is of spiritual all Radio growth. Archives and all of these four I will try and deal with in the context of the holistic view that I have put before you. Let me start with the physical. Shareer madhyam khalu dharma sadhana. The Vedas say very clearly that the basis of all dharma, of all action is the body. And unless the body is, is properly trained, properly looked after, no other development is really possible. Our children have got to be taught how to sit properly. I go to uh, schools and I see children slouched all over their chairs. They're not even taught how to sit properly, how to breathe properly, how to walk. This may sound very simple, but it isn't really. 
I remember many years ago when I was in health, we worked out a graded syllabus of yoga for school so that we could introduce these simple yogic systems into the school level at a very early age and thereby help the children to develop their entire physical uh, bodies. It is, it is a total uh, uh, misnomer, I think, to say that you need very expensive equipment in order to uh, train the body. It's not true. Of course, if you can have gymnasia for crores of rupees, it may be all right. But you do not really need it. If you can introduce yoga, proper posture, proper breathing into the schools at the, at the grassroots level, you will find a new, a, a new development uh, taking place. Nutritional inputs, immunization must be made part of the school program. We talk now of human resource development. Human resource development must involve nutritional recording. inputs and immunization. The integrated child development scheme was one such scheme which uh, is attempting this, but it has not yet taken off. The idea is that when the child is at school, that is the time to put in all the inputs that are required. I was astonished to learn that two spoonfuls of vitamin A a year, two spoonfuls a year, that's twice a year, one spoon of vitamin A syrup, can prevent thousands of children from becoming blind. Can you imagine what a gift sight is, what a fabulous gift, what we would be without sight? And yet, thousands of Indian children lose their eyesight every year because we are not able to give them two spoons of vitamin A syrup twice a year. So unless we are able to integrate this program, the nutritional program, the, the, the uh, uh, body strengthening program into the school system, it is no use talking about integral in education. There is, of course, mass drill and ports and NCC, that's self-evident. But there doesn't seem to me to be any commitment to physical fitness as such. We often lament our poor uh, performance in the Olympics, although we are one-seventh of the human race. The reason is, there is no commitment to physical fitness as a people. I once said when I was looking after family planning, that in addition to birth control, we need girth control also. I mean, you, you find people going around uh, looking, in a, looking most extraordinary, not being able to uh, look this after their bodies properly. Radio, uh, Our recording. food habits are extremely undesirable. We have a malign racism in our food habits. We are obsessed with white rice, white sugar, and white bread, all three of which are totally useless from the nutritional point of view. There is no reason whatsoever why in a country which is still suffering from massive malnutrition, where the nutritional inputs are among the lowest in the world, there is no reason why we should have these absurd food habits and throw away all the nutritional uh, inputs as a result of this, this obsession with white rice and white bread and white sugar. Now, this may all not appear to be directly connected with education, but it is from the point of view that I am talking about. Because we are now developing the entire body, the, the posture, the sports, the, the yoga, the nutritional inputs, the food habits, the parents need to be educated, and, of course, the education now regarding tobacco, alcohol, and drugs, and promiscuity. This also has got to form part of the educational system. It's no use having anti-smoking campaigns once the children have all got hooked on the tobacco habit in the first instance. I happen to be president of the uh, anti-smoking society of Delhi, but it's too late. You have got to teach the children that the intake of these poisonous substances, and tobacco, alcohol, and drugs are in fact poisonous substances, these are disastrous for their health. These are disastrous for the health of the nation. 
and this has got to become part of our educational system so the first element of our integral education must be this carefully this drawn out program of physical fitness and well being and it must involve all these various elements that i have mentioned including if i may say so at this point the education of the parent because many of these uh, uh, elements are not only to be found in the school they are to be found in the homes and therefore when the children go to school there must be some way of feedback to the parents there must be some way in which the parents can get involved and can also get educated in the process of the education of their children this as i see it is the element of physical growth and integration the second element is what i would call intellectual growth now i am not here talking of the academic side of it the academic side is well known uh, i might uh, briefly mention what we need we need the universalization of primary education which is a constitutional imperative we need the vocationalization of secondary education and we need the rationalization of higher education those are the three tasks that we must set before us primary education has to become universal we cannot talk of a functioning democracy if millions of indian citizens are illiterate and are not given at least elementary education this is a travesty and whatever happens now the eighth plan is going to begin very shortly we have to give the necessary inputs to universalize uh, primary education then secondary education very briefly we have got to vocationalize it at some point in time the 10 plus 2 formula i am afraid has not worked at all because This the vocational stream that has been brought in in the plus 2 is simply not enough to provide for what the framers of that scheme had hoped what they had hoped was that after taking the vocational stream the students would be siphoned off into vocations and the aimless drift from school to college would uh, cease that is not happening as against an expected 50% of people who were supposed to be siphoned off i was looking at some figures the other day hardly 2% uh, or have taken up to vocational education therefore it's clear that the present scheme of vocationalization has failed and therefore it has to be reorganized i won't go into details of how it can be done i'm simply pointing out that this is something that has to receive priority we have to vocationalize we have to have at least a 3 year course after the 10th standard so that the young men and women who pass it can go into their vocations and this drift to college can be can be prevented and then in higher education also we have to rationalize the whole system because at present there is aimlessness in higher education i meet a number of young people and many of them say that really they feel it is a waste of time that when they go to college there is no seriousness either among the students or among the teachers and one of the reasons of course is that everybody tends to drift into college whereas in the so called developed nations you cannot get into college you may be you may be the son of the richest person there or of, of a king or of a lord you simply cannot get into college unless you pass those entrance examinations but here for want of anything better to do everybody drifts into college naturally the atmosphere in the colleges is devoid of any real commitment and any real serious so these are some of the tasks that we have to do in the on the academic sphere plus of course reorganization of teachers education strengthening adult education and reviving the library movement uh, trying to encourage young people to read but more important than the academic uh, elements are what i feel the intellectual input should be more important than what we learn is whether we are developing the capacity to learn or not are our intellectual faculties being sharpened because what we learn is often obsolete 
even before we leave college. All the chemistry that I learned at school, for example, and all the physics and all the mathematics is all out of date. It's no longer true. I mean, you know, the, the, the explosion of knowledge is such that every five years, every 10 years, a new generation of knowledge is born. So the biology, the, the botany, and all that you learn is totally out of date. So it is not important, not so important what you learn. Have we developed the capacity to learn? Do we develop, among our uh, young boys and girls, the, the quest for truth, the capacity for awe and wonder at the marvels of nature, the capacity to, to uh, respond to the glory of the sunrise and the grandeur of the starry heavens on a moonless night. It does not cost anything. It does not cost anything to teach children to look at a tree or look at a flower and realize the beauty that is in that object. How many of our children are taught simply to look up at night recording. at this starry firmament in which we live? Do we tell them that there are hundreds of billions of stars in our own galaxy? Hundreds of billions of stars in our own galaxy and hundreds of billions of galaxies in the observed universe? Do we give them any sense of the wonder of the mystery of being alive or being conscious in a situation like this? People talk about miracles. What greater miracle can there be than that from the slime of the primeval ocean four billion years ago, today a creature has emerged with a brain which can become aware of itself which can become aware of being. None of these things are taught to our students. We totally demystify, de-beautify, we uglify all our knowledge. We put it into such a boring and such an unattractive format that even the great insights uh, of uh, human beings are reduced to, uh, to commonplaces. So, the point I'm making is that if we talk of integral education, if we talk of the flowering of the intellect, then we've got to develop these intellectual capacities. We have a tremendously rich heritage. We have this heritage of music, of dance, of art. We've got to introduce the students to this aesthetic dimension. The study of the classics has totally disappeared. Now, the study of the classics, I think, is extremely important, not so much for the classics themselves, but because the study gives a certain intellectual discipline, whether it is this Sanskrit is or whether it is Radio Arabic or whether recording. it is Persian. The classics had a very special role to play, and that role was to train the mind, to train the sensibility, because once you have been exposed to a, a glorious language like Sanskrit, for example, your aesthetic sensibilities are refined. Your responses uh, become more, uh, more accurate, more elaborate, more imaginative. It is, they have disappeared. The three language formula, I'm afraid again, like the 10 plus two formula, the three language formula has not worked. I travel throughout the length and breadth of India. I find it is not working. And I have been suggesting for many years that we should give a choice in the three language formula. In the Hindi speaking areas, we should have Hindi, we should have English, and as a third choice, we should give either Sanskrit or Urdu. And in the non-Hindi speaking areas, there's a regional language, there is English, and along with Hindi, we should introduce Sanskrit, because it will make it easier for the South Indian students to learn Hindi if they can go through Sanskrit, because that is the base of their own language. Now, these are, these are important uh, elements in the development of the mind, because language par excellence is the, is the human faculty, communications. If you cannot communicate, you cannot grow. And how do you communicate except essentially through language? And one of the great tragedies, I think, in India today is that that feel for the language is disappearing. 
whether it is English, whether it is Sanskrit, whether it is Hindi or anything else, language is now looked upon as just a common currency. There has been a devaluation of language. The concept of the sacred the word, the logos, the Shabda Brahma has disappeared. And language is simply used in, in, in the most horrific ways nowadays to try and, try and have some interpersonal communication. So I think the importance of recapturing the inner, the inner beauty of language, of, uh, of reinstituting the uh, elements of intellectual uh, inquiry and of intellectual uh, uh, thought, this is very important. I really am not so worried about what our young people learn, but about whether or not they have learned to develop their minds. Because one thing is very clear. If one thing is predictable, it is that everything is going to change. In our own lifetimes, we have seen human civilization change beyond our wildest dreams. I remember when I was at school, uh, an aeroplane, if an aeroplane flew over, we would all run out of our rooms and just look up, because we couldn't believe that there was such a thing as an aeroplane flying. Television didn't exist at that time. Within our very lifetimes, there have been these multiple revolutions. And how do we know what else will happen in the decades to come? Therefore, we have to be prepared. The youth of India has to be prepared intellectually to deal with the, uh, with the new knowledge that is growing to cope with the new knowledge. And we have the capacity. Even today, if you go to the United States, your Indian intellectuals, nuclear scientists, computer engineers, medical professionals are at the top of their, top of their um, ladders. The Indian mind is second to none in the world. In fact, we have, as I said, this continuing heritage of, uh, of this many, many centuries and millennia. What we have to do is to once again uh, reorient our inner perceptions. That is what is required. We are so obsessed with the outer. We are so obsessed with, uh, with what is happening in politics and what is happening outside that we have neglected the inner intellectual reorienting, without which there cannot really be any substantial and sustained growth. And so, I think for today, I will leave these thoughts with you. I have dealt with the physical elements and the intellectual elements of an integral approach to education. Tomorrow, what I will try and do is to talk about the social implications of education, which are extremely important, and then culminate in the spiritual growth, which to my mind is probably the most important undertaking that any human being can do at this particular juncture. Thank you.